Good morning, Oasis. How's everybody doing today? It's really great to have Adam Jenks to lead us in our music this morning and to have Brother George Coates back to uh, share our message later. So without further ado, Adam, lead us in worship, brother. I invite you all to stand here as we worship together. Father God, in these moments, we just want to offer up our praise, our thankfulness, everything that you've done for us, God. You're a good God this morning. And we can we can take these moments to be filled and it can give us the the breath in our lungs and the, the grace that we need to be able to make it through this next week, God, because we know we're conquerors through your name. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
going to preach, then I know who it is. My brother George could have come and share a message with me. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I'm back. <laughs> to uh, some surprise, I am back. Uh, I am honored to be back. It's a privilege, sincerely, for me to come and be here. I enjoy the spirit in this place. I enjoy being with you and the relationships that uh, we developed through the uh, last few years together as we walked, and so it's a privilege to be back. I greet you on behalf of Pastor Eric this morning. Pastor Eric uh, contacted me this week. His son uh, uh, came down with COVID this week. Not a, a very severe case, but he was nevertheless diagnosed with that, and so Pastor Eric was exposed, and he was uh, recommended to not come this morning, because none of us want that opportunity to be uh, exposed to that that uh, event in our life. And so I don't know if you've been through it or not, I haven't, but uh, I am blessed and highly favored. I'm so grateful, and thank you, Eric, for leading uh, the worship this morning. That, that song is true. The psalmist said that surely goodness and mercy will follow me, but uh, Eric added a little difference to it. He's running after us this morning. So I'm grateful God's running after me today. How about you? Are you with me? All right. I am grateful God is good and his mercies endure forever. Thanks again for sharing with us this morning, Adam. And he'll be back in a few minutes. So I want you to take your Bible with me this morning, and I want you to turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 27. Uh, as I was speaking with Pastor Eric this week, I am very aware of the fact that as a congregation, this year is a milestone year for you that that there is going to be a significant transition here as it relates to pastoral leadership. Uh, Pastor Eric uh, and his wife have been here. They have been faithful to the ministry here. And, and in many ways, after a couple of years, they are, they are your pastor. But the reality is, is that uh, they came with the intention to be the interim ind individual, the one that would bridge between the past and the future. And... He believes that that is coming to an end in his season here at this ministry. So the question remains for us to consider. So what does the future look like? And how do we move in to the future in, in a way that is biblical, that's honoring to Christ? Mar uh, having and finding a new pastor is much like getting married. You marry the wrong person and uh, life can be pretty miserable, right? Uh, Solomon says in the Proverbs, it's better to live in the corner of an attic than with, a, than with a quarrelsome wife. So you need to have this relationship that is very positive and nurturing and biblical in its orientation. And so this morning, what I would like to do is address the issue. And Pastor Eric will continue on a monthly basis, sort of helping Oasis at Conway Gardens to understand what it transition looks like what you are going to face, what you need to be looking for. And so this morning, he asked if I would if I would sort of launch this sort of idea to this congregation in January. And so I would love for you to, uh, to watch this again or get a pencil and piece of paper because I believe that God has given to me some things that uh, will be very helpful. When I left pastoring, uh, in 2013, I was the former pastor of Calvary Assembly in Winter Park, that um, I understood that, that uh, transition was very, very significant. Uh, but little did I know that until I realized that after the next three years, I had been asked to do what Pastor Eric has done. I had served as the interim pastor in three different churches in uh, the Central Florida region. And so in that process, I learned a lot. I, I know what you're feeling. I know what it's like to talk to a congregation that doesn't yet feel like their future is in the, in the windshield. They sort of see it still in the rearview mirror. So what does God have ahead? What does God want to do? And I can assure you that, that he, is, he is a gentle, loving shepherd, and he is not going to force a flock to do what a flock doesn't want to do. So how does the, the flock, the body of Christ, we who are in this position, how do we navigate? How do we think? 
What questions do we ask? Those are the things that I'd like to sort of attempt to launch this morning and to help you in the process of this transition understanding. But I want us to pray and ask, ask the, the, the Holy Spirit to just guide my thoughts and to help us today to connect. Because I don't want to just preach a sermon. I want to inspire you. Because I truly believe this. I, I told you how old I was last week. But I'm here to tell you that at my at 70, I believe my greatest days lie ahead. I've claimed the words of, you remember Caleb and Joshua, the two that went in the promised land. I claimed Caleb's, his words when he said to Joshua, after they got into the promised land, give me this mountain. He said at 85, he said, I still have the strength of a man that's 40. And so I declare that I am not going to let my future be dictated by my past or even by my age or the culture or anything. I believe that the church is God's prized possession. I believe that the word of God is still true. I believe that God is still victorious in all situations. So what we must do is tap into what God is wanting to prepare us for so that we move into our better days ahead. That's why we're here this morning. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to come back this morning and minister the word of God. I speak, first of all, healing over um, the Loudermilk family. I pray that no, no further disease or infection will impact them. I pray for healing. And anyone in this body of believers, Lord, protect us. Let your hand of healing rest on us. And, and that where there is need, Lord, you are the solution. You're the healer. You're the provider. You're the victor. You're the counselor. You're the mighty God. And we trust you for that. But this morning, my assignment is to begin to talk to Oasis Church at Conway Gardens to be able to help them. To know what to expect in the days ahead as they prepare to look for a full-time shepherd over themselves, the flock of God here in this location. And so I pray that you will anoint my words, my heart, that I won't say or do anything that is contrary to what you have in store for us today. And I'll thank you in advance for the outcome, for I, I pray it all in the name of Jesus. All God's people said. Amen. 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 You know, transition is natural. Here's the one thing about life. It, for, for the 5,000 years or so we've been on this earth, you know, people have been born and people die. And seasons come and seasons go. And in the midst of it, cultures change. Philosophical issues arise and change. Things happen. Transition is probably the most natural thing to happen. When I looked into the mirror uh, this morning, I looked at my forehead. There was a day when that was just brown skin. Now it's all age spots up there, you know? I mean, that's, that's transition. That means George is getting a, a little bit older in the midst of it. Some transitions we love and we choose and we're welcoming. And others are thrust upon us. And here's the reality. Success or failure in my life or in anything is determined by how I handle that transition situation in my life. That's true individually. It's true organizationally. It's true of a church body, a business, a government, anything. It's always how we accept and look at transition. There's some something in, in life we call midlife crisis. You heard about that? I don't know if you ever did. I always thought when I say the word midlife crisis, I see a guy in his late 40s, early 50s, with his shirt unbuttoned and a gold chain around his neck, and he's bought a car he can't he can't afford because he believes that he's losing his youthfulness, and so he's going to go through this crisis and he's going to try to get back what he thought he lost when he moved into the years of time in the midst of that, and, it, and it, because of that, so many lives are broken and and shattered marriages and situations because of it. I, I don't know if. if you remember, but I remember when our daughter went to college. It's called the empty nest syndrome. When she left the house, my wife said it is going to be the most horrible year. That's what she said to me. So you prepare yourself, George, because I'm not going to like it that we're in the house alone by ourselves. 
I said, but look, you married me. We didn't even have her when we got married. But you love her that you're going to be and act that way. And the good news is she didn't act that way. But the whole idea was transition from a child that's been there for 18 years to now that child is gone. She never came home to live again. She always has visited but never lived again. We had to find what it was to do life again as a married couple without our daughter in the mix. But that's part of transition. I've gone through uh, six transitions in my 47 years of leadership ministry. And I know that transitions hurt. I'll never forget the very first church that I pastored in the inner city of Chicago. I stood up after 10 years and I knew that I knew that God had asked me to step away and to, to become pastor of another congregation. And when I resigned to that morning, it just as though it happened yesterday. A man stepped out from the middle of pew, halfway back in a church, a building just about this size, and he sort of ran down when I was walking down. He ran down and he ran up and looked me in the face. And the words out of his mouth was not, Pastor, I love you and I pray God's best on you. Words out of his mouth were, why do I feel like you just divorced us today? Transition to him was the feeling of divorce. It wasn't the feeling of happiness for what God was in the midst of doing. And the reason why is, is that we always tend to look at transition from the perspective of, how is it going to affect me? How do I feel about it? Rather than understanding the bigger question is, what is God up to? You see, God's got plans from the beginning of time when this church was birthed. That God knew that this day would be here. He knew this situation would be here. And in the midst of it, he wanted to bring you as a congregation to a place where you would trust him and believe that there were things prepared for you that you, you had to get here for him to release and to do your best days. Sincerely, it's not, this is not some kind of jargon or some kind of nice statement a visiting preacher is supposed to say. I believe it with all my heart because I know the last chapter in this book and the last chapter says God wins. So because God wins, I always know that the future is better than the past. That's what God's up to. Transitions happen in a moment. They can happen very quickly. You can, you can go on a vacation and end up in a hospital uh, emergency room. I've had that happen to me. It, you can be married and then find yourself single. You, you, you can be Dating uh, and then single again. You can be employed and the next day unemployed. It happens very, very quickly. But God will often use the times to lead us to a place in transition that we don't understand. That he can show us something wonderful about his nature and his purposes for our life if we will just take and embrace it. So here's the first thing I want you to do. And I want you to write down. I want you to remember. Transition is normal. And God knows where you're at. And I want you to embrace it. Embrace it as a moment in your history. Where God is up to doing something wonderful in your life. In the, in the book of Numbers. I ask you to turn there. Let's look at it together. Shall we? Numbers chapter 27. It will be on the screen behind me. Uh, you'll be able to follow along there. But I want to read to you the text, and I want you to understand that uh, not only am I saying that this happens and it's normal, but it happened all through the history of Israel. It has happened ever since Jesus came to this earth, lived, died, was raised, and then ascended back into heaven. Transition has always been a part of God's process. He's always been engaged in the process. But hear the word of the Lord this morning. Numbers 27, beginning with verse 12. One day the Lord said to Moses, Climb one of the mountains east of the river and look out over the land I have given to the people of Israel. After you have seen it, you will die like your brother Aaron, for you both rebelled against my instructions in the wilderness of Zin. When the people of Israel rebelled, you failed to demonstrate my holiness to them at the waters. These are the waters of Meribah at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, you are the God who gives breath to all creatures. Please anoint a new man 
as leader for the community. Give them someone who will guide them wherever they go and will lead them into battle so the community of the Lord will not be like sheep without a shepherd. There's some overview that's needed here very quickly before I give you five obvious things that Moses prays in this prayer that we need to, as a congregation, be laying foundationally in our prayer life, in our thought life, about what the future looks like. What you need to know is that you're in the last year of Moses' life. He's lived, he's 120 years of age. He was 80 when he was called, he lived for 40 years. He would be filled with work and preparation for transition in the midst of this because God wanted him to know that he was a part of the transitional preparation. God had made it clear that Moses couldn't go into the promised land. And in Numbers 20, verses 1 to 13, God gave Moses and Aaron the instruction, if you remember, at, at, as they needed water, this time, or the first time, 40 years earlier, they had been in the wilderness and needed water. And God told Moses to strike the rock, and he struck it and water came. But this time, God says to Moses, Speak to the rock. But Moses was upset and angry. You see, attitude impacts our relationship with God as well as with others. And how we, how we respond and obey to God's instructions determine whether or not we will experience his hand of, of blessing and prosperity or he, we will experience correction in the midst of it. And so what happens is, is that he, instead of speaking, he strikes the rock again. And as a result, God says, for the punishment of doing that, because you didn't obey me, that you can't go into the promised land. So God had to get ready a new man to take Moses' place because of his disobedience. In the midst of it, until that point, Moses met face to face with God. Deuteronomy 34.10 tells us that he was both prophet and priest to Israel. But Joshua received his communication from God through Eliezer, the priest. Following a series of emotional and stirring farewells that you'll read about here in the book of Numbers, we find that Moses' last charges to the people. Moses is ready to anoint a new leader by laying hands on him and proclaiming him as Israel's new man that's going to follow Joshua was about to wear the biggest sandals he had ever worn in his life. If Joshua was a, wore a size 9 sandal, Moses had worn a size 20, and he felt the pressure of that. But si selecting a new leader in a time of transition was so important. And I want you to know with me what I believe was Moses' clear understanding because what he prays in this prayer becomes the articulated values of what any leader that is going to lead the flock of God must up uphold in their life. I wish I had time to take you through, through Joshua's life and the preparation. But at this point, God, uh, Moses does not call Joshua by name in this place. But he simply describes the characteristics of of this man that he would ultimately lay hands upon and make him very much aware. So I want to move to the qualifications that Moses stipulates for his replacement. And if you look with me in verses 16 and 17, you see them there. And I want to highlight them for you. Let me read them one more time. Numbers 27, verses 16 and 17. O oh Lord, you are the God who gives breath to all creatures. Please appoint a new man as leader for the community. Give them someone who will guide them wherever they go and will lead them into battle. So the community of the Lord will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So here's five qualifications of your new pastor. Here are five things that when you interview someone... When you pray for someone, as you're thinking about what the future looks like, Moses identifies five characteristics here that they must possess if they are going to be effective as a leader in a congregation. 
And this is so when you question them in the future, when you talk to someone, when you write, when you need to ask them about these areas of their life and what does the reflection of their ministry past look like as it relates to this. Qualification number one, write it down. He's a man of prayer. He's a man of prayer. If you look at it in the midst of it, we notice that Moses, the very first thing he does, he starts this statement by, oh Lord, he starts praying. Because Moses understood the power of prayer. Moses said that the new leader would, oh Lord, you are God. Moses began the request for the replacement with prayer. You need to understand that the only way to get anything from God is to communicate with God. And the way God creates communication between man and himself is he has ordained prayer is that opportunity. Every day on your prayer list, at the top of your prayer list, you should have, we're praying for God to send us the right man and family that will lead this congregation because if God doesn't put his hand upon it, we don't want it. You don't, you don't hire someone on the basis of, of their experience alone. You don't hire somebody on the basis of their pedigree alone. You don't hire somebody based on their education alone. You hire somebody because God seemingly is impressing this upon you because that's the relationship that he's choosing to bring to you. A person's prayer life tells you a lot about their dependence on God. Do they have one? You should ask someone about their prayer life. The one that's going to stand behind this sacred desk must daily know what it is to communicate with God himself so that he can hear the word of the Lord. Moses was a man who went into the tent of meeting, the scripture says, and would go face to face with God so that he would know the direction that he would take and lead the people, the children of Israel for 40 years. And that wisdom comes from no human counsel. It can only go as far as what God in his ultimate wisdom has given to man so that he might know what to do. In the midst of it, assembling and moving forward, we need to understand that the person that you call, if they are not a person of prayer and they don't understand and have a prayer life, if they can't articulate that and be able to reflect how they spend and hear God and know his voice in their life, then they're not a person that you need to have as your pastor because they will not be able to lead you to green pastures and beside still waters. They will not know how to fight the enemies that will come against you. They'll not know what to do in the future and the process that you find yourself in. I love what... James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in James 1, 5, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Let me give you the George Scope translation. If you don't know what to do, pray. Pray. That's what James was saying. Ask God. Because God is the giver of wisdom to those that diligently seek him and know him. Prayer is the premier quality of the person who needs to lead this church. Qualification number two, they need to be a leader. They need to be a leader. Notice the new leader of Israel was to go and will lead them. Moses said, I want you to give them, give us a man that will lead them. Now, what did Moses mean by that here? He, he was saying that these people need a man who will lead them. Leadership is a big subject these days. A leadership proverb, he who thinks he is leading and has no one following is just taking a walk. All right? If you don't have somebody following, you're not leading. Moses was leading because three million people were following him. Moses knew where to go because those three million people watched him go into a tent of meeting and come out and say, this is what God would say to us. This is what God wants for us. And the reality is that leadership is not about, again, degrees. It's not about, again, just experience. Leadership is one who is able to walk and understand that God is up to something so supernatural that unless I spend time in his presence, my people will not know that this is what God wants for them. I can, I can stand here for the remainder of this hour and share with you story after story 
But I think that the greatest sign of leadership in my ministry was one morning I was preaching just like this. This was many years ago, back in the 80s. We, we were facing, I had accepted the responsibility to pastor a church that was bankrupt. They had no money. They had a five-year balloon that was now three years away from coming up, and we didn't have the money to pay the balloon, and we were going to lose the property and everything that this church had done, and it was founded in the 20s. That was my responsibility. I couldn't, I, every seemingly turn that I went, I couldn't find an answer. And so one Sunday morning, I was preaching like this, and the quiet voice, the voice that I know that I learned in my prayer life, the quiet voice of God said to me, I want you to stop preaching, and I want you to do something that's very difficult, very strange. And I remember having this conversation in my head while I was trying to preach to a congregation. And here's what the Lord asked me to do. He said, I want you to walk around this property right now. I want you to just walk out the door, and I want you to invite people to go with you. And uh, in the process, uh, I, I want you to do that. And he didn't give me the reason why. But, but I'll, I, I can, I've just got to be quick. I will tell you, I shared with the congregation, I stopped preaching, shared with them what I felt God was saying, and I said to them these words, I'm going to walk out and I'm going to be obedient to God. If you think God is, has spoken to me, you can follow me. But if not, just stay where you're at. I, I, I was too nervous. I was just a young guy. I walked out the door, made a left-hand turn, got to the outside door, made a right turn, and I thought it was about 100 yards when I get to the end of the parking lot, I'll look back to see if anybody's following me. And I was scared spitless when I made that turn to look back to see if anybody was following. But when I looked back, they were still coming out of the church. We walked all the way around that building. We walked back in. And when I walked through the door first, because I was the leader, there was no one in the building. Everyone had followed. And let me just fast forward that to tell you that one year later, we built a new building. We raised $400,000 cash from 115 people in 1987 to see God do a miraculous thing. And it all began with what seemed to be so obscure, crazy, wild. Why would you do that? It was embarrassing, but it was obedience. Because in obedience, God sent me there as the leader. And as the leader, people followed. And as the leader, people invested and engaged and believed. And the leader, as the leader, I was able to see God's hand move so supernaturally in that place. To this day, they're paid off. They built three more times. God has exploded the work in that church. And all because it starts with a moment where a leader says, I know what God is saying. I know how God is speaking. I'm going to follow. You need a man like that that knows how to lead, how to listen, how to, how to follow God and let God do what God wants to do. Because then you have everything that you need because that's what God has promised to those who walk uprightly before him. Hallelujah. So you need a man of prayer. You need a leader. Here's number three. Qualification number three, you need a spiritual fighter. Moses prays for a man who will lead them into battle. See that? This refers to the man's ability to fight. For 40 years, God had done all of the fighting for Israel. But now God knew that Israel was going to move into the promised land, and it was going to have to do its own fighting. God was giving Israel other people's lands, Land that had been promised and now needed to be conquered. And that's why he needed a man who knew how to do battle. But let me remind you that the battle now in our day, we're not out conquering land, but we are still battling. Because Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness in high places. That we are battling spirits of opposition. We're battling a, an invisible spirit and the enemy devil himself that wants to resist the, the kingdom of God and the work of God and this church. And what we have to do is have someone who understands what it is to stand in the presence of God, be robed with the authority and the righteousness of Christ. To put on the armor of God and to stand and to know that when we fight spiritually, we will win. Because the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. Hallelujah. I, I'm passionate about this church. This is the God we serve. This is the qualification that we have. We today have to understand that this is not easy. In fact, I read not long ago that 
the, 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 the toughest job in the world is, is being the administrator of a large hospital. So you think about uh, Advent Health Hospital, that's the toughest job, whoever administrates that hospital. Second toughest job in the world is being the President of the United States. Third toughest job in the world is the pastor of any size church. And the reason that's challenging is because we live in a, we, we live in a culture and in a time when leadership at times can be questioned and doubted. And, and that it's going to be a fight. There's gonna, and, and I don't mean that negatively. There's going to be times when you don't understand. I'm sure those people didn't understand why I walked out that door that day. But they trusted me as a leader. I proved myself. But in the process, we have to understand that we are going to have to fight to get what God wants for us. Because the enemy is not going to lay down in these days that we face. Let me give you number four real quick. Got two more. Qualification number four, he needs to be a godly navigator. A godly navigator. Notice what verse 17 says. Moses was looking for a man who would guide them wherever they go. Now, this refers to a leader who would lead them into the land. Remember, God had made the promise to Moses that, and a reminder of what he had made to Abraham. I'm going to take you to a land that land is going to be yours. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And as a result, Moses knew that a leader had to know where he was going so that he would not miss. There was a particular spot. There were, it was boundaried by God. God gave clear instructions what was the land of Israel. Moses understood that the, the leader that was going to come had to understand what those boundaries were and understand the responsibility of providing the resources, divvying up the land and all that would be there. They needed to know what God would say and do. They needed to be a godly navigator in the plans and the promises of God. God has promised this body of believers that if you seek him, you will find him when you search for him with all your heart. God has promised you that he would give to his church spiritual men and women that would lead in God. And as a result, you need to understand that that is true here today. Let me give you the last one and I'll close this morning. The fifth qualification is we need to have, he needs to be a shepherd. Moses was looking for a man to be their shepherd. So he writes, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. The man who won't die for his sheep isn't a shepherd. He's a hireling. You don't want a hireling in this church. Your spiritual protection is the greatest responsibility that any shepherd has. Not his will, not his ways, but your spiritual condition. How you are cared for and how you are responsible. A lot was written by uh, the Apostle Paul and Peter that in the last days there will be wolves in sheep's clothing. But a true shepherd will recognize a wolf that's in sheep's clothing, bringing warning and protection to his pe people. Paul writes to the Ephesian church that upon his departure, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock, Acts 20, 29, he says that. And so as a result of it, the scriptures are clear that what you need is a shepherd. So when you're, when you are looking, you're asking these five questions. Is the person we're going to interview a shepherd? Does he understand godly navigation? Is he a spiritual fighter? Is he a leader? Does he know how to pray? That's what you're looking for. And don't settle for anything that's not that. Because that person will not provide for you what it is that God has in store for you. I'm going to close with it. 1 Timothy chapter 3. There, there are seven verses that are really important here. Because in the, in the Old Testament that we've been looking at, Moses gives this dictation. But the New Testament is very clear. Here it is, and I think it will be on the screen. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer. An elder desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, 
hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So notice the things here. A good reputation, morally pure, well-ordered philosophy of life. He needs to have self-discipline, having respect and be credible among other people, unselfish with their material possessions. Not in bondage of fleshly appetite, sensitive, non-defensive, kind and gentle, leads their own family, and not prideful. That's what the New Testament says. The man that stands behind this pulpit is responsible for. Is it possible to find someone that would come to us? Because that's the big challenge. We're, we're not as big as other churches in the area. We don't have all of the, 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 the fluff and the stuff that other churches have. We're, we're, just a, we're just a congregation that's been here for a long period of time. Is there anyone out there that can we can trust and that will accept us and will trust us? And the answer to that question is absolutely. And here's why I can say that. is because this church, your life, was not bought with silver and gold. You were bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, the scripture says that, that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word doesn't pass away. And then his word goes on to say that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That God is not going to let the enemy prevail against a work that belongs to his. But here's the question. Here's the challenge. Here was the challenge of Israel. Will you accept the leader? Will you let them lead even when the transition looks a little different than the way it was before? Because the reality is Joshua led entirely different than Moses. Joseph, Joshua's responsibilities were entirely different than Moses. And so what you're going to face is, will you trust that God will bring to you the individual that will love you and accept you. They will have these specific ideas about them. They're, they can pray. They can lead. They're a spiritual fighter. They understand how to navigate. And they're a true shepherd. It's interesting. I, I did my doctorate degree in leadership development. And one of my responsibilities was to look through the scriptures and to ask the question, since the word leader is not used in the original language in the same context or, or understanding as we have it. So what is a leader in Scripture? How would, what word best describes a leader in the, new, in, in, the, in the Scriptures, both Old and New Testament? And here's the interesting answer to that. The answer to that is shepherd. God always wanted us to know that he was the good shepherd and that he would send shepherds who would love the sheep and care for them, provide for them. Shepherd would have to fight as David, the lion and the bear. The shepherd would have to protect. He would sleep in the, in the cold. He would, he would have an uncomfortable life because he loved the sheep more than he loved himself. Those people are still there. They may not be the most famous. They may not be the most popular. But there are people in this world that love Jesus that haven't bowed their knee to finance, to bail, to theology, to frameworks. They still want to honor Jesus and serve his flock. I'm here to tell you this morning that you guys are in good hands. That you are 
going to make good decisions. I speak over you today the words of life and happiness and purpose. I declare that there will be a day as Jesus carries that you're going to look back to this day and say, I, I, you know what, I heard George say those things, but I didn't know if they could ever come to pass, but they have come to pass. Because I'm here to tell you, you belong to Jesus. This church belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to a man. You trust Jesus, and Jesus will lead you to a shepherd who will also lead you to the place of purpose, meaning, and empowerment, and give you a future that God has prepared for you. If you believe that this morning, you will join me in agreement. Would you say amen? Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity of sharing a message to the church this morning. It's a message of, of hope. It's a message that, that's been tested in time and found that it works. It's true. Lord, I, I speak over this body of believers today that you will just give them the confidence to know that he who called them is faithful. That he who is has given his very all for his people is the one who will, in fact, do all things right and well. Lord, may the words that we have shared this morning dig deep, bear fruit by giving root into people's lives. I thank you for doing this good thing today. And I pray it all in the name that is above every name. The name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. I invite you to, to sing with me in this song as we respond to Pastor George's message here, that we would invite the Holy Spirit into this atmosphere so that we would have the wisdom and knowledge as we uh, carry on together and find a new uh, minister here for our congregation. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is a It's your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts
this next song it's kind of been our it was our confession song here as we as I've been here these last uh, few months. I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we sing this this anthem here. I'm not enough unless you Give you a minute just to reflect, and they're not all bad.
ashes would you come forward? Heavenly Father, you've kept us here a long time. You're not about to leave us now. I pray for the offering today. I pray for every giver, every gift. And I thank you, God, for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you watch over us today. I see it over and over. We just pray today that each of us will be of one accord, looking to you with what you have for us in our next chapter. Again, bless it all. In Jesus' name.
I said to him uh, before he came up that I wanted to say something, and what he said was what I wanted to say. <clears throat> Isn't it true? God sent you Eric, Pastor Eric. And if God was faithful to send you that thing, then God is going to be faithful to do the next step. He can only take you so far. His calling and his ministries and his giftings, he allowed God to use them. But God has someone that's just. His future is just you and this congregation. So here's what I, I just felt like that I needed to add. I'm going to ask you every day to just simply say these words every day. When you think about the church, say, Lord, I trust you. For our future. You know, words mean something. When God created, he, he, he spoke everything into existence. So when you speak something, God hears you. So I want you to say it with me. I just want us to get used to it. God, say it with me. God, I trust you with our future. Say it again. God, I trust you with our future. One more time. God, trust you with our future. And when you think of the future, let that trust equate to faith. God's got that person. They've already been marked. The future is so wonderfully bright. And God's going to honor the leaders that have been in this church that have stood for the years of time. This building is not here by accident. You are not here by Numbers don't matter with God. One will put a thousand to fight two, ten thousand. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there is the creator of heaven in their midst. So we've got all that it takes. You've got the right chemistry for the future of what God has for you. So I just want to encourage you with that. Remember, what are you going to say tomorrow morning? There you go, God, I trust you with our future. And I want you to say it every single day until that future is revealed. God bless you. Thanks again for the privilege. Well, I think we've heard quite a challenging message this morning. I love all you guys, and uh, I know you all love uh, this church. Let's keep loving it, and let's do exactly what George says. Let's pray for that man coming for the future. I am on the pulpit committee, along with Stephanie, and along with Pat. Uh, so I pray that you pray for us. We are talking and booking and interviewing people. Uh, God's going to send us the right man. I know so because George told me so. <laughs> and the Bible. Right? Amen. Go in peace. Love you guys.